Good morning, church. Good to be back with you this morning. We're in Hebrews chapter 9, if you want to go ahead and follow along. Hebrews chapter 9, and we'll jump around a little bit this morning through the scriptures, here a little and there a little. And uh, what we're going to contemplate this morning is a topic or a teaching which you will find in no other place but the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is a topic which is unique in our understanding of the gospel, in our understanding of what Scripture teaches. And uh, for this reason, it is sometimes viewed with a little bit of skepticism and a little bit of uh, uh, concern by those who are not familiar with it. And it's my hope and my prayer that through, the, through our study this morning, you will find the glorious message of the righteousness of Christ uh, through these pages of Scripture. Let's just bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, just bless us as we read your word, bless us as we contemplate it, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9, from verse 6. Now when these things had been thus prepared, the priests always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience, concerned only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of reformation. Wow, what a mouthful. That's quite a long sentence right there. Hebrews is one of my favorite books. I don't know if you've ever taken the time to go through slowly and unpack verse by verse, chapter by chapter, the book of Hebrews. It's a most powerful book, which I would encourage you to do that with. I love it because it is so Christ-centered. Everything all the way through the book of Hebrews is all about this idea of Christ being much better. He starts in chapter 1 with Christ being much better, much greater than the angels. He emphasizes the point that Christ is not merely an angel because to no other angel has the Father ever said when He came into the world, bow down and worship Him. In other words, Christ is not merely an angel, but He is the divine incarnation. He is the Son of God. Chapter 2, he speaks about Christ in relation to humanity and points out that he is the much better human being. He is the much, much better than the angels. He's much better than humanity. He goes on to speak about the leadership of Moses and again writing to the Hebrew Christians, many of whom were no doubt Jews coming out of Judaism, converting to Christianity. This was to be a very fundamental idea. That, that they had placed their trust and their belief in Moses. For instance, how many times in the Gospels do you not find them contrasting what Jesus is saying with Moses? You know, but Moses taught us, what do you say? They held Moses in such high regard and esteem, and rightly so, because Moses was even more than a prophet. He had almost face-to-face -face, uh, relationship, communion with God. God spoke directly to Moses. He met with him on, on Mount Sinai. And so Moses, in the mind of the Hebrew, is, well, could we say on a par with Abraham? Abraham was the father of the Jewish race, but Moses was the greatest of all time leaders. He was the one to whom the law had been given, and the law was fundamentally what they were all about. And so Moses was held in high esteem. So Jesus is much better than the angels. Jesus is much better than any human being. He has authentic, 100% human characteristics. He is also much bigger than the greatest leader in, 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 in Jewish history, much greater than Moses himself. He then goes on to the Levitical priesthood, and in the book of Hebrews, he describes how there is a much greater priesthood than the Levites. Now, you can must understand, if you were a Jew, that would be a very uh, difficult pill to swallow. After all, many of those whom he was writing to were probably of that tribe, of that priesthood. That was their calling, and they had been the only ones that were permitted to participate or to, I should rather say, to lead out in the worship services regarding the sanctuary. Now, 
Jesus was not born of the tribe of Levi, yet the teaching of Scripture is that when he ascends to heaven, he is the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. So how can this be? He's not of the tribe of Levi, yet he is the high priest. And so the author of Hebrews, who I happen to believe was Paul, goes through and in great detail explains that even in the Old Testament, there is a, there is a precedent to this because there was a man by the, by the name of Melchizedek. He was not of the tribe of the Levites. After all, he was many hundreds of years before the Levites were even in existence, in the time of Abraham, in fact. And Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation, paid tithes to Melchizedek, who he equates to, to, the, to the person of Christ in that we don't know anything about the beginning of Melchizedek, nor do we know what happened to him at the end. And so he equates this to Jesus, saying... Christ has no beginning and he has no end. And so he is a priest in the order of Melchizedek who was rightly recognized by Abraham, the father of the Jewish nation. Therefore, we should have no problem recognizing that Christ is the true high priest and that he is the one that ministers on our behalf. So Jesus is the much better than the angels. He's the authentic human being who succeeds where we fail. He is also much greater than Moses, the greatest of all Jewish leaders. He is also much greater than the Jewish system of priesthood. And Jesus provided a much better sacrifice. The Jews were accustomed to sacrifices, lambs and goats and all sorts of different sacrifices in different circumstances. The whole book of Leviticus, the first part, is all about these different sacrifices, none of which in and of themselves, one by one, could comprehend or teach the fullness of what Christ would accomplish through his death. And so Jesus had inspired through the Holy Spirit this system, this sacrificial system, each sacrifice illustrating an aspect of what Jesus would accomplish through his death. And then Paul comes in Hebrews and he says, now everything that was taught, everything that was foreshadowed in the book of Leviticus pertaining to the sacrifices, Jesus has accomplished and his sacrifice is the reality. In fact, we picked up on that at the end of our scripture reading because he makes a point that those earthly sacrifices, they could never, never satisfy or atone for the guilt of conscience. That's why we had to keep offering them again and again and again because they were not the reality. They pointed forward to a reality. The death of Christ at Calvary, he says, is the much greater sacrifice. He goes on to speak of a much greater promised land later on in the book of Hebrews. That, that the, yes, though the children of Israel entered the earthly land of Canaan, there is a heavenly Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem, that we now look forward to. So the book of Hebrews, all the way through from beginning to end, is taking the Old Testament and making us look at it through the eyes of the gospel experience, making, it, making us look at that Old Testament system through the Christ event putting on our Jesus goggles, as it were, so that we can see and understand the reality that all of that pointed forward to. It's an extremely powerful, Christ-centered book. And right in the heart of that book, as he speaks about the Levitical priesthood and Jesus, the much greater priest, as he speaks about the sacrifices of, the, of Leviticus and how Jesus is the, 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 the fulfillment of those sacrifices and the much greater sacrifice, he also goes ahead and brings in this idea of the sanctuary. And he says, just as there was an earthly sanctuary where all these things centered and all these things were illustrated, so too there is a heavenly sanctuary. And we look now to that heavenly sanctuary, which is the locus or the very center of the plan of salvation. That is where Christ Jesus, as our heavenly high priest, pleads his much better sacrifice in our behalf that we may receive the authentic experience of forgiveness and the cleansing of a conscience and ultimately the assurance of our arrival in the heavenly new Jerusalem. And so he begins this discussion, in fact, here in chapter 8, verse 1, where he says, Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. There is a number one church street in heaven somewhere. There is a place where God has his throne, where he rules from, and where the center of the plan of salvation has its very being and its very center. It's called the heavenly sanctuary. The earthly was an example. 
And for us to understand what Christ is doing for us now, we must understand what was taught in the Old Testament. I don't know if you've figured this out yet, but the New Testament, while you can make a lot of sense of it by just reading the New Testament, the depth and the, 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 the symbolism and the profoundness is increased exponentially in relation to your understanding of the Old Testament. The Old Testament just... When you read the New Testament and you understand the Old, the two come together in a way that neither can do by itself. And that's really what I want to look at, you, look at with you today. This idea here of the earthly sanctuary being a foreshadowing of a much better heavenly sanctuary. What went on down there? What was it like? Now, I don't have time to get into all the detail of this. We could do you know, a whole week of studying on this subject and not get to the end of it. But he starts Hebrews chapter 9 by giving us an, an out, a description of the, the layout of the sanctuary. You know, there were two parts. There was the holy place and the most holy place. And in the holy place, there were certain items of furniture. There was the, you know, the, the, the table with the, sh the 12 showbreads on it. it was the, there was the, uh, the, the seven-branched menorah or golden lampstand. There was the altar of uh, incense, which incidentally, the author of Hebrews places in the most holy place, not in the holy place which we know is, in fact, not correct. It is in the holy place. So why did he do that? Now, one option is he made a mistake. You know, writing too fast, brain somewhere else while the hand is still behind. He doesn't quite get it right. I don't know so much about that. I find that hard to believe with someone like Paul. A Pharisee of Pharisees, educated at the feet of Gamaliel. I mean, this was a man who understood the system backwards and forwards. Unlikely he would make a mistake like that. But what we do know is the functionality of that altar of incense was, in fact, in the most holy place. It was on this side of the veil because it had to be, you had to have access to it on a daily basis. The priests did. But the functionality of it was actually to transcend the veil and enable the prayers of the saints, as it were symbolically, to go past the veil into the very presence of God, which is manifested in the, holy, in the most holy place. So they operated it on this side, but the incense went up over the veil into the most holy place. And even on the Day of Atonement, which we'll get to in a little while, the priest was not to go in there without incense. The incense was to be taken in in a special little burner, as it were, and it was to fill that place. Because when you read the book of Psalms, incense is a symbol for the righteousness of Christ, which makes the prayers of sinful, defiled human beings acceptable to God. And the teaching there is that though it is on this side of the veil, though there is a separation between us and the direct presence of God, accepting Christ into our lives ensures that our prayers are heard by heaven. It transcends the gap. It transcends the separation that sin brings because through the merits and the perfection of Christ our Savior, our prayers prayed in our ignorance and in our sinfulness and in our misunderstanding mentality sometimes will, through the merits of Jesus, be heard and be found acceptable in the presence of God. He goes on to describe the most holy place, that that's where the law of God was, the tablets of the covenant, verse 4, that there was this box uh, with the angels on top called the Ark of the Covenant, that that's where the presence of God was manifested, and so on and so forth. And he says, now listen, I don't have time to get into that all with you, as I don't, to, as I don't really this morning either. He says, what I really want to make the point of, and then he starts in verse 6. There were two services that took place in that Old Testament sanctuary system. The one was called the daily because it happened how often? Daily. Every day of the year, the daily services were conducted, hence their name. But once a year, there was a new service. And it was called the yearly because it happened, how many times did I say? Once a year. On one day, at the end of the religious year in the Jewish calendar, came this day called the Day of Atonement. Uh, the Jews would have called it Yom Kippur, the Day of Judgment, the Day of Atonement. Now, atonement means what? Well, a simple way to remember it is really just to break it into its English syllables. Now, this is, you know, not the best way to figure out what all words mean, but it happens to work with this particular word. Atonement. At-one-ment. Does that make sense? 
the, the job of atonement is to make us at one with the person whom we've been separated from. That means dealing with the sin problem, because according to Isaiah 59 verse 2, it is your sins which have separated you from your God. So if we are to be made at one, or if atonement is to be made for us, then the problem of sin must be dealt with. And this was the crux of the matter with everything in the Old Testament, with all the sanctuary services and all the sacrifices and all the offerings and the whole priesthood and the high priest and all the things they did. It was a graphical enactment, a, an illustration in real time, everyday life of how this all-important task of atonement is accomplished by God on behalf of humanity. You see, this was the whole concept that the Jewish life and religion revolved around. And it's really the most important concept in life. Listen, you can have the house on the hill, you can have the great big car in the garage, you can have everything this life calls success. But if your mind and your heart is not centered in the experience of atonement, of being made at one with God, you have nothing. Because it's all going to burn. <laughs> it's all going to turn into nothing. And so the whole system that God put his time and his energy into illustrating in, in the Jewish economy was the concept of salvation. Now when you read Leviticus and you read those books of the Old Testament, it's very easy to get lost in all the minutia of the detail, to not even see the message. But once you understand the gospel message and you look at those passages again through the gospel eyes, it just brightens up with detail of helping you to understand how salvation works. How do I receive salvation? Because if I don't have that, friends, you've wasted your time on earth. It took me 18 years of my life to figure out what the purpose and the meaning of life is. So can I shortcut the circuit for you? Should I tell you what I discovered? The purpose of this life is to get ready for the next. <laughs> it's about as simple as I can make it. The purpose of this life is not getting rich, increasing with goods, having many children, having good relationships and all that. Those are added extras which can be a blessing, sure, but it's not the goal. The great purpose of life is to sort out and remove the separation that exists between you and God. Once you've sorted that out, death is no longer an enemy and you're ready to really begin living. The purpose of life is atonement, at one -ment. And this concept of the sanctuary helps us to understand, like no other, how this happens. Every day, it says, every day when these things have been thus prepared, verse 6, the priests always went in every day into the first part of the tabernacle, perf performing the services. On a daily basis, sin would take place outside the camp or in the camp of Israel, outside of the sanctuary area. And what would happen? You would do something, you would have a meltdown, you would fall, you would fail. Now, you need a savior. And so in that Old Testament era, you would go and you would get a, a lamb or a goat or depending on what the sin was or what the sacrifice you were offering was for, you would bring that, that animal. Now, we're just going to simplify it and use the illustration of the lamb, okay? And I would bring that lamb. And all this detail is in the book of Leviticus, by the way. And I'd bring that lamb and I would come from my tent outside of, outside of the sanctuary area where sin had taken place and the sanctuary was the place where God was. Now, is there any wickedness or sin in the person of God? The scripture is clear about that, right? No, he is righteous. He is perfect. He is sinless. Now, I would bring my guilt for which I should die with my lamb with my animal, I would come to through the courtyard, and the courtyard was fenced off with basically white sheets. It wasn't a security fence. It was a symbolic fence. Do you get the point? It wasn't barbed wire and, and steel and alarms and electric fencing and all of that. No. The goal wasn't to keep people out. It was a symbolic fence. When you step through that, what does the book of Revelation say uh, white linen represents? The righteousness, right? Righteousness. So you would come through that, and, and there was a doorway there. And interestingly enough, in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the door. I am the door. 
So you would come through the door, a symbol of Jesus, and now you were fenced in in that courtyard with the righteousness of Jesus, and you would come to the altar of sacrifice. And there you would meet the priest. And at the altar of sacrifice, he would hand you a knife. Now this was something the priest didn't do. The priest would not take the life of the victim because the priest had not sinned. Are you with me? Who was the sinner? The one who's bringing the victim. And so I would place my hands on the head of that animal and I would confess the very thing in which I had transgressed. Symbolically, my guilt goes from me onto this innocent victim who, by the way, was not the runt of the litter. It had to be a perfect animal, because who was that animal representing? The perfection of Christ. And so now my guilt, symbolically, is placed on this innocent animal. The priest hands me the knife, and I have to slit the victim's throat. What do you think that would mean? What does that tell you about what happens at the cross? Was it the Jews that nailed Jesus to the cross? Was it the Roman authority under Pilate who's guilty for the death of Jesus? You know, sometimes Christians can get very hard on the Jews because the Jews crucified our Lord. No, 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 no. When you stand at the foot of the cross, what the Old Testament teaches is you nailed him to the cross. I nailed him to the cross. That Roman centurion who picked up the hammer and hit the spikes through his hands, I did that. You did that. We are personally accountable. We are personally guilty for the death of Jesus. It's not somebody else's fault that he died. It's my fault. So the priest would not kill the victim. The sinner had to kill the victim. Salvation can only come when you and I reach the point in our experience where we stop hiding behind excuses, stop placing the blame on somebody else, stop diverting attention away from ourselves when we look in the mirror and realize our guilt, our personal culpability, our personal uh, uh, transgression, and we realize that because of what I have done, he had to die. It's a personal exchange of place. And so through the daily services of the sanctuary, every day this was taught. Now the priest began his work. Now the victim is bleeding out, and the priest catches that blood, tainted with the guilt of confession, tainted with the guilt of the sinner, symbolically speaking. He catches that blood, and now the priest is carrying that guilt in the blood. Are you following the progression? Now he takes that blood, and according to different circumstances, different things were done. Sometimes it was simply dealt with right there in the courtyard, at the altar of sacrifice. At other times it was placed there, and it was taken into the holy place, and placed before the veil. So you have had sin coming from the outside, committed outside of the presence of God, brought right into the very presence of God, through the door, a symbol of Jesus, fenced in by the righteousness of Jesus, uh, the lamb, a, a, a symbol of Jesus, the blood, a symbol of his blood spilt in sacrifice for you and I, the priest, a symbol of Jesus, carrying that tainted, guilty blood into the holy place, into the very presence of God. Now the sinner goes home justified. There's a big word. Learned about it in our lesson study this morning, right? There's another way to, to, to remember justified, right? Same thing as atonement. Again, not the best way to figure out every word in English, but it works. Justified never sinned. To be justified is to be, to be, if I am justified, I am made justified never sinned. Did you get it? The forgiveness of Christ has made me just as if I had never sinned. Atonement has begun to be take, take place. But notice this, the work is not finished. Now, a lot of Christians end here. Justification has taken place, forgiveness has taken place, so salvation is over, done, dusted, completed. But there was more. You see, the sinner went home justified. Sin was no longer his problem, but the sin was now the problem of God. God had taken it upon himself to deal with it because he had taken the place of the sinner. He had been sacri sacrificed in the person of Christ through the symbolism. And now that sin wasn't just disappeared in, hasn't just disappeared into thin air. It is where? 
in the sanctuary. Now sin defiles. So the sanctuary symbolically is carrying the guilt of the sin that is being confessed by those folks who have sinned, by you and I. Through our confession of sin, Jesus stands in our place. His blood, His sacrifice washes us clean. We experience freedom of conscience, freedom from guilt. But that guilt, that condemnation, that sin, that all that defilement is now in His hands. And He still has a work to do to deal with the sin problem. Now comes the yearly service. So every day of the year, this has been illustrated graphically. The people have participated in it. Those things could never save them. Those sacrifices, those animals, Hebrews is clear about that. It all pointed forward to the coming Redeemer who would be the real high priest, the real sacrifice, the everything, right? Now, end of the year comes. This has been going on for every day of the year. And all of a sudden, the day of judgment comes. Yom Kippur, the day of atonement. The high priest was the one who had to play the role. No, no, no normal, no ordinary priest. By the way, in my understanding from what I've studied, all those little priests, if you want to call them little priests, those that were not the high priest, were logistical extensions of the high priest. In other words, when you study scripture, the only one that really counts in terms of explaining what Christ does for us is the high priest. But it's impossible in the Old Testament system for the high priest to be the only priest and have to do everything. And so all the other priests were almost extensions of the high priest so that the things could get done. So on the Day of Atonement, it is the high priest who does this work. Again, there's a whole description of it in Leviticus chapter 16, which we will try and summarize very briefly. But on the Day of Atonement, a sacrifice was made. He would make a sacrifice for his own family, of course, because he too is a human being and so on and so forth. But eventually the real service comes. And a sacrifice would be made. Two goats were brought. One was chosen by lots to be the scapegoat, and the other was chosen to be the Lord's goat. So what would happen? One goat was sacrificed, and one was not. Now this is very important for you to understand. How is the forgiveness of sin brought about. Hebrews chapter 9 tells us, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins or forgiveness. Now, don't misunderstand this, because this is one of those areas where sometimes people misunderstand what we're saying with this teaching. Because that scapegoat, who is known as Azazel, is a symbol of the devil himself. And so what people say is, well, you see, at the end of the service, the sins are placed on Azazel, a symbol of Satan. So you Adventists teach that Satan is the sin bearer. No, we don't. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins, right? And only one of those goats is sacrificed. Azazel, the symbol of the devil, is not sacrificed. He is sent out into the wilderness never to be seen again, and that typifies the fires of hell which come down and will destroy him so that he is never ever again seen. He doesn't carry our sin. He doesn't atone for our wrongdoing. Only the goat that is sacrificed as a symbol of Jesus is the one that carries the sin. So here a sacrifice is made. And then the priest goes directly into the most holy place. Are you with me? And he takes the bowl of blood. And you've got to see it in your imagination. He's standing there in front of the presence of God. The incense has filled the compartment. And there he is in the presence of God in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And he dips his fingers in the bowl of blood. He sprinkles it seven times on that solid, golden, uh, beautiful uh, mercy seat. In Hebrew, the kaporet. In Greek, hilasterion. And there he is. He sprinkles it seven times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The blood symbolizes the death of Jesus. The blood is the sacrifice. And the number seven throughout Scripture indicates perfection and completeness. So here is a sacrifice pointing forward to Jesus' blood and His sacrifice that is illustrated as being all-sufficient, complete, absolutely needing nothing else to be added to it. So seven times. Then according to Leviticus 16, He takes a step back and He does the same thing. He sprinkles the blood on the floor in front of the Ark of the Covenant seven times. Then He goes out into the holy place now on this side of the veil and He stops at the most significant uh, furniture, item of furniture in the holy place which was the altar of incense. 
and he sprinkles the blood seven times. He takes a step back, and in front of the altar and in front of the veil, he sprinkles the blood another seven times on the floor. Then he goes out into the courtyard to the altar of sacrifice, which has been operating all year, which has been accumulating the guilt of the confessed sins, defiling the courtyard. And he goes out there and he places the blood on the horns of the altar and he sprinkles it seven times. And then at the end of that, he goes on to deal with the scapegoat, which we'll talk about just now. What was this illustrating? You will notice that during the daily services, where did the sin begin? Out there in the courtyard, uh, out there outside the courtyard in the camp of Israel, right? It was brought in through the sacrifice into the courtyard, and then from there it went into the sanctuary. Can you see the direction? From outside coming in, and it defiled the sanctuary. That's why when you read in Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14, the longest time prophecy in the Bible, it says, For unto 2,300 evenings and mornings, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Speaking not of the earthly sanctuary. Well, Adrian, how do you know it's not the earthly sanctuary? Very simple. Because when you study, uh, you know, uh, the book of Ezekiel chapter 4 verse 6, Numbers 14, 34 and various other texts, you'll know that in the context of prophecy, just like the beasts are symbolic for something and the horns are symbolic for something, all these prophecies are symbolic, so too the time period of a day is symbolic for something. It's symbolic for a year. Are you with me? So if you take 2,300 days, that's 2,300 years. Are you with me so far? Now, I don't have time to prove this all to you, but you can go and read uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. It gives you the starting point for this time period, from the going forth of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62, and so on and so forth. It gives you the starting point. You go to the book of Ezra, chapter 6 and 7, you find out what that is, the seventh year of the reign of Artaxerxes Longimanus. That takes us to 457 B.C. That's your starting point. Got it? Hope you stayed with me there. If you didn't, that's okay, because it's not that important for the purpose of this sermon. 457 BC, now you count down 2,300. Remember to add one at the end, because when you go from 1 BC to 180, you skip a year, because there is no zero. So you end up with 18, what's it? 44. Okay. Is that Old Testament or New Testament times? Is that BC or AD? AD. So how do I know that that prophecy does not pertain to the Jews in the Old Testament time uh, with the earthly sanctuary? Because when I do the, the time calculation, I go right down past this time that Paul is speaking about. He's in a New Testament era, and he's saying, guess what? Jesus is the much, much greater than the angels. He's much greater than any human being. He's much greater than our greatest leader, Moses. He's much greater than, and so on and so forth and so forth. He's the high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. We no longer look to the earthly. So the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14 cannot refer to anything in the Old Testament. Therefore, if it's a cleansing of a sanctuary, then which sanctuary are we looking to? Earthly or heavenly? Heavenly. Did you get the logic? So something happens. Since 1844, this thing called the yearly service, this thing called the Day of Atonement, the Day of Judgment, Yom Kippur, is happening. Just like it was illustrated in the earthly sanctuary, it is now in reality happening and taking place in the heavenly sanctuary. So we have a much greater Day of Atonement as well. It is the reality. Now, at the end of the earthly day of atonement, sin was finished. It was over. It was dealt with. Those sins that had been confessed. The ones that had not been confessed, we have a fancy way of calling it. We call it cherished sins. You know, those are sins which we don't actually want to give to Jesus because we know we'd have to quit them if we were to give them to Him. And uh, we actually, well, we like them, so... You know, we'll give him 95% of it, but the other 5% we'll hang on to. That's a pretty good deal, Lord. You know, 95%, that's not bad. He wants 100 or nothing. 100 or nothing. Cherished sins are those which are not brought into the sanctuary because they are not confessed. They are not placed on the victim who is Jesus. And therefore, he cannot take them from you by force because he respects your freedom of choice, and so they remain on your head. Now, those are not the sins that are dealt with through this whole process. Are you beginning to understand why all this symbolism and all this Old Testament stuff helps us to understand how salvation works and how important it is? 
You cannot be saved as long as you hold on to even one cherished sin. You cannot be saved. Hey, if, that, if you want that one cherished sin, then just take it all back. And just forget about the whole salvation issue. Now, that's not my goal to th this morning, to encourage you to do that. But it's the same thing, isn't it? The only sins that can be dealt with are the ones who, through freedom of choice, are given to Christ. They are confessed and laid upon Him. His blood and His sacrifice takes that guilt away from you. And at the moment of confession, you receive a clean conscience. But there is still a work that He does for you in the heavenly sanctuary. You go home justified. You go home forgiven. You go home rejoicing because this weight has been rolled off your shoulders and you say, praise God, today salvation has come to my life and indeed it has. But your sin is still being dealt with. In the sanctuary above. In the hands of God. Now here's the question I want to ask you. Why is there this delay? I struggled with this for a long time. Why is there this delay? You see, in the popular churches of the day, in general Christianity out there, there is this idea that this is how salvation works. You confess your sin, you are forgiven. So far, it's just like our version, right? You go home free. Yes, we will agree with that. And at that point, those sins are never again to be seen whatsoever under any circumstances. And that's the part we disagree with on the basis of the teachings of Scripture. It is possible for you to see those sins again. It is possible. The purpose of what happens in that yearly service is to eradicate that record of sin which was transferred away from you onto Christ through His blood into the very throne room of God, that place called the sanctuary. And there He still does a work to clear that record once and for all. Why is there this apparent delay? Why is it that I am not just at the moment of my confession, I am not only forgiven experientially, but in reality everything is just wiped away and I can never find it again. It's all dealt with. Why is there this delay? Ezekiel chapter 33 is a very interesting passage. And it helped me to answer that question. Ezekiel chapter 33, just before Daniel. Ezekiel 33 describes the experience of salvation. And forgiveness. So it says here from verse 12, Therefore you, O son of man, say to the children of your people, The righteousness of the righteous man shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness, nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, so this is someone, they've confessed their sins, they, they, they've, they've claimed the, the, the sacrifice of Jesus, and now the Lord pronounces them, declares them justified, declares them righteous, right? You shall live. When I say to the righteous that he shall live, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, none of his righteous works shall be remembered. But because of the iniquity that he has committed, he shall die. Again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. If he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, and walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live. He shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. Okay. Now, we all like that last section because that's where we've come from. We've all been sinners. We've all been in a place of lostness. And God has forgiven us and we shall not die because of our wickedness because He has covered us, right? The part we don't like is the first part that we read, uh, which really is a clear scriptural passage against the idea that once you're saved, you're always saved. You can never be unsaved because He says, if I say to the righteous, you shall surely live. This is the person who's found salvation. But he trusts in his righteousness such that he goes out and deliberately commits, commits iniquity, turns back to his old ways, he will die. You can be saved and then be unsaved <laughs> if you turn to a life of rebellion. Right? You can be married and then be divorced, right? It's not once married, always married. That's the ideal. But it's not the reality for many people, right? Same thing with salvation. 
So notice what he says here. This is, this is how you understand salvation. It's like an insurance policy. How many of you have insurance? Yeah? Good. You should have. I have it too. So you have an insurance policy, and let's just take life insurance for the sake of the illustration. I take out a life insurance policy. Now, the conditions of the policy are that as long as I pay my premium, I am covered, yes? If I die five minutes after I've signed that document, I'm covered, right? Or if I pay for 60 years and die at the end, I am covered, right? Okay. Now, here's what happens. I've uh, been paying my life insurance for a long time. And I get to a place in my experience where I think I haven't had a heart attack, I haven't died yet, you know, I've been paying for the last 45 or 60 years. I don't think I'm ever going to die. So I stop paying my insurance premiums. What happens? My policy lapses. Am I now covered? No, I am not covered. And sure enough, the day after my policy lapses, I have a heart attack and I die. So my wife phones up the insurance company and says, now listen, I realize he didn't pay his uh, last premium. It was only one month's premium, all right? I realize he didn't pay his last premium, but uh, he had been paying for the last 45 years of his life. Won't you please pay out? Tell me what the answer is. Sorry to hear of your loss, ma'am, but no, we will not pay out. Oh, but come on, it was 99% of the premiums were paid. Can't you at least pay out proportionally? Like, you know, can't you give me 99 or I'll even settle for 95% of the value of the policy? Just pay out something, please. What's the answer? No. You see, that's what it's like when you take out Christ's life insurance policy. He has paid all the premiums in full at the cross, and he offers to give you his life cover for free. Right? So some people say, yes, Lord, that's the deal of a lifetime. I want that life insurance cover. So we accept that the premiums are paid. It's all by grace. We receive it, but somewhere along the line, we don't like this life insurance policy. We don't like this cover, and so we reject it. Now, here's what happens. Let's say I've been walking with Christ for 45 years of my life. I accept Christ when I'm 20. I work, walk with Him all through my youth up into my old age. I'm now 65, and I die of a heart attack, and I appear before God in the judgment. Now, as long as that life cover was still on me, how much of my life was covered? 100%. Even the 20 years before meeting Him is covered, right? That's the concept of forgiveness. My whole life is covered in full. So I enter into heaven. But here's another scenario. I accepted Christ when I was 20. I walked with Him until I was 65. In the last year, I got upset because somebody didn't look at me right in church or, you know, some significant event happens. I get angry with God. I shake my fist at Him. I tell Him to get lost. I go to my old ways of life before I had accepted Him. Now, at 66, only one year after I've rejected God, heart attack comes and I'm dead. I appear before the judgment seat of Christ. He says, Adrian, you're not covered. You rejected my insurance policy. You are not covered. I'm afraid you're going to have to experience the punishment for your life of sin. Oh, okay, Lord, that's fair enough. But remember, remember, out of my 66 years, 45 of them are covered, so you can't punish me for the 45 years. So according to my calculation, that's only 21 years of sin to punish me for. What do you think the answer is going to be? Or I say to him, you know what, I know that, but it's actually only one year of punishment because, you know, I accepted Christ when I was 20. You forgave me that past. I walked with you for 45. So that is 65 years that are covered. So it's only the one last year that I can be punished for. What do you think the answer is? No. You are either covered from beginning to end or you are not covered from beginning to end. There is no partial covering. There is no percentage-based covering. You can't wake up in the judgment one day and say, oh, yes, but Lord, I walked with, walked with you for so many years, I was covered by you, so those years are excluded from punishment. doesn't work like that. 
It's life insurance. He's paid the premiums and he offers you the cover. You either accept it and are covered or you reject it and you are not covered and exposed. So that's what Ezekiel explains to us. Now all of a sudden, you've got the missing puzzle piece that helps you to understand in the full understanding of the gospel why there is this apparent delay from my justification where I experience the forgiveness of my sin, my guilty conscience is cleared experientially, my sin is dealt with, and yet this idea that the record of my sin that is confessed transfers to God and only at the end of his work in the heavenly sanctuary is that record of sin once and for all removed. Why is it that I am forgiven experientially and yet there is still a work that God does with my guiltiness to once and for all eradicate it from the record books of the universe? Why is there this delay? Because of this concept of freedom of choice. At any point where I am covered by the insurance cover of God, covered by the insurance policy of Jesus, I have received forgiveness. At any point in life's history, I can say I don't want that insurance cover anymore. And so because of freedom of choice, that record that has been removed from you must now be gone and dug up somewhere and be placed back on you because that's what freedom of choice means. Freedom of choice means freedom of choice. (laughs) If I don't want the cover, if I don't want the forgiveness, if I don't want the atonement, then God cannot force it on me. So at one stage, I did want it, and I confessed my sin, and the guilt rolled off my shoulders, and it went into the heavenly sanctuary, and now it's there. And I went home free, and I was like, praise the Lord, hallelujah, salvation has come. But somewhere along the line, I wasn't satisfied anymore. I liked the vomit that I was eating, so I went back to it. And with great regret in his heart, God has to say, well, I cannot force you to maintain your life cover. I cannot force you to accept my forgiveness. If you want your old life, then you have to take your whole life in its entirety. You are either covered in entirety or you are uncovered in entirety. Does that make sense? And so that record is in the heavenly sanctuary. And when is it dealt with? At the time where you and I can no longer choose. Which for most of us will be when? When you die. Now the book of Revelation talks about a universal close of probation and so on and so forth. And so it must happen if Jesus is to come while there is still a race alive. We won't get into that side. For practical purposes... For most of us, the point at which we no longer can choose is when? When you are laid to sleep in the grave. That's why we believe that heavenly judgment work up there begins with the dead. Because the living are still writing their life story. The living are still given an opportunity to receive the life cover and the salvation of Jesus Christ. But they also, having received that, have at any point the right and the freedom of choice to reject it and to say, I don't want that life cover. I want my old life back. Give it back to me. Pray to God none of us will be like that. But if you do, God will obey your wishes and will give you your old life in its entirety. But... If you have accepted the life cover from beginning to end, at the end of your mortal life, and you die and your decisions are made and sealed and you cannot go back because the dead die and know nothing, then guess what? Your life work is compared with your profession of faith. Now listen, when you go into a court of law and you are accused of a crime and you stand up and you go guilty, Is there a court case that ensues after that to determine whether you're guilty or not? No. If I stand up in a court of law and I say, guilty, the end, come back for sentencing in a week, right? That's why the heavenly judgment only deals with confessed sin and not with unconfessed sin. Because those who cherish sin, those who want their sinful way, are standing up in God's court for all intents and purposes and saying, guilty, Okay, fine. Then you're guilty. But it is those who have claimed to be not guilty whose lives must be examined. Does that make sense to you? You're standing up in the court of law and you are actually guilty, 
but you're saying, not guilty on account that Jesus has paid my price. He is the lamb. He is the high priest. He is the sacrifice. He has carried my guilt. He has dealt with it. And so I'm claiming his life, his merits, not guilty. And so in that work that's taking place in the heavenly sanctuary, while you live your life and still write your story, the evaluation is not about those who have claimed to be guilty. It's about those who have claimed not guilty. And so how do you evaluate in a court that the person who's claiming to be not guilty is in fact not guilty or is in fact guilty? You bring in what? Evidence. Witnesses. Exhibit A. Exhibit B fingerprints, DNA, whatever it takes in this day and age to prove guilt or innocence. What is the evidence according to Daniel chapter 7 in this heavenly judgment scene that is brought in? The court was seated and the books were opened. You are writing a book, friend. You are an author. Your everyday choices, your decisions, your lifestyle, the influences you choose to assimilate and draw into your life, the friends you keep, the things you cherish in the heart, are writing and authoring a book in heaven with your name on it. And when you claim not guilty and you receive the forgiveness of Christ, the court of heaven knows one thing that those who are not guilty and receive the principle of regenerating power into the life are transformed, right? And so those who claim not guilty in the courts above by the merits of Jesus Christ, their lives as recorded by the recording angels, by the Holy Spirit, are brought into that heavenly courtroom and placed before the Ancient of Days, the judge of the earth. The profession is not guilty by the blood of Jesus, does the life show the power of the blood of Jesus? And when those two match and the life chapter ends and we have died and we can no longer choose, the verdict is made not guilty indeed. And that record is removed once and for all. But when the life record shows cherished sin, when the life record shows a love of the world, then that profession to be not guilty is declared to be a lie. And that life is no longer covered by the insurance policy of Jesus. Somber realities, are they not? Seriously understanding the plan of salvation, friends, is all important for you and I. Jesus paid it all is true. But have you accepted it all? Have you made the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus the basis of your life and your decision? Have you received the righteousness of Christ, not just in an effort to escape punishment, but because you want a new life, because you love the character of God, and you no longer want to be a part of this world and its sin and all that is associated with? It's not just about what you say with your lips. It's how you live your life. There is a work that has been happening since 1844, and according to my calculations, that's about 166 years. I think it's almost finished. And when he has finished that work, friends, he's coming to fetch you and I. And sin will be a thing of the past. The question I ask you today is are you going to live beyond sin because you're in the righteousness of Christ? Or are you going to pass away with sin when it is destroyed? This morning I want to ask you where you are in relationship to Jesus. And I want to ask you to make a commitment to this Jesus. Not some blasé, non-substantiated, commitment to Jesus, because I know I've been a naughty boy, a commitment to Jesus to separate from sin, to say, Lord, do whatever it takes in my life. Take me through the valley of the shadow of death if you must, but do whatever it takes to separate 
me from my sin. Give me the courage, give me the love for you, Lord, that I will love you more than those cherished habits, more than those cherished sins. I want them to be a thing of the past. I want nothing to do with them anymore. And I want to give you an opportunity to come forward and join me for a special prayer. If you want to recommit to God today and say, Lord, I need forgiveness. And this preacher's first year, you notice that, right? I need forgiveness. But I need more than forgiveness, Lord. I need a renewal of the Holy Spirit in my life. I need you to awaken my conscience, and I need you to help me to be, get serious about soul-searching and removing sin from my life, giving it to you through the act of confession. And I want to invite you to come forward and have prayer with me this morning. God bless you. Come forward and find a place where you can kneel. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, this morning, we come to recognize that you have poured all of heaven out in the gift of Jesus our Savior. You could give us nothing more than what you haven't already given us. And on top of that, you've given us the Holy Spirit. There is a work to be done in our lives, Lord, in our church, in our community, in our homes, amongst us as parents and amongst us as children. And it is our prayer this morning that you would do that work. We come to you and exercise that gift of freedom of choice. To say, Lord, please forgive us in those areas where you know we've been holding back. Help us to take this work of preparing for your soon return more seriously, as if it were actually a life or death issue. For that it is. Will you bestow upon us the spirit of conversion? an emptying of self, and a filling with your presence. Will you bless us this morning, Lord, with the knowledge of sins forgiven and the power to live in harmony with you and with your law. Father God Almighty, may we be able to look upon your face on the day of your return with confidence in the merits of Jesus, say, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. We thank you for these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final song this morning is one of rejoicing. I invite you to stand as we sing it together. Heavenly Father, as we leave this place, may we go with your blessing. May we go in the righteousness of Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name.